Hello, everyone. Welcome to Due Process. This is Trevor Wadden. Today, I have the great honor and privilege of speaking with John Kingman Phillips. John is an experienced and sought-after lawyer with over 30 years of legal experience. John received his law degree from Osgoode Law School in 1989. He's a senior partner at the Toronto law firm Waddell Phillips, a boutique law firm that specializes in a number of areas, including civil and commercial litigation, administrative law, and human rights. John's tenure as a lawyer has seen him handle a wide variety of cases in areas such as corporate law, class action lawsuits, civil litigation, employment law, and criminal law. He has been recognized as being one of Canada's top 50 trial lawyers by Benchmark Litigation for the years of 2019 and 2020. John has been involved in some of Canada's most notable legal decisions, appearing in all levels of court and representing a wide variety of clients, including the survivors of residential schools, Omar Qadar, and CSIS intelligence officers. John was also involved in the 1991 precedent-setting disclosure case of R.V. Stinchcomb, the first case where disclosure was recognized as a constitutional obligation, resting on the crown, and that case will serve the basis of our conversation today. John, thank you very much for coming on the show, and it's great to have you. Thank you, Trevor. So, John, the purpose of our chat today is is to give listeners a good understanding of the Stinchcomb decision, and namely why full disclosure is such a key to ensuring fair trial and full answer and defense for a person accused of a criminal offense in Canada. But I first wanted to get a little bit more background of your involvement in the Stinchcomb case. As I understand it, you graduated from law school in 1989, and by 1991, you were already involved with this case and, and appearing in the Supreme Court of Canada, serving as co-counsel with another legal legend that the now late Mr. William E. Code. Is that right? Can you take us through that process and kind of how you became involved in the the case? Yeah, uh, Bill Code and I became involved uh, for the purposes of the appeal. So the trial had gone before us and Mr. Stinchcomb had been found guilty on 27 counts of fraud and breach of trust and had been sentenced to, if I recall correctly, nine years incarceration. So we came on to take the matter to the Alberta Court of Appeal And when we lost there, sought leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, got leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, and then went up to the Supreme Court in 1991 and got the decision that sort of changed the changed the landscape of criminal proceedings in Canada. Right. And John, did you guys have a sense at the time of how potentially important this case was going to be to Canada's legal landscape? We did. And just to give you by way of a bit of background, historically, the crown prosecutors and the police were the ones who made decisions basically at their discretion as to how much information or documentation the opponent would receive, the the defense would receive as they move forward. There was no requirement either under the criminal code or constitutionally for them to provide anything other than what at their discretion they thought was going to be sufficient to allow the defense to try to respond. And what that meant in practice was if you had police that got blinders on or a crown that was committed to a conviction. Documentation was not provided and information was not provided that might be of assistance to the defendant. And our case came up after three main major cases in Milgard, Moran, and Dan Marshall. So the, the three M's yeah. of leading wrongful conviction. In each of those cases, there was issues about what had been disclosed to the defense and what had not been disclosed to the defense. And if it hadn't sort of accidentally been uncovered later and there was there's those various proceedings that, that there had been obscured information, those three gentlemen, at least some of them, would have likely been executed under the old Canadian law. And that created a framework within which there was huge amounts of academic and judicial criticism of what was going on for providing the defense an adequate opportunity to make full answer and defense to the Crown's case. And notwithstanding that, the legal landscape before we started Stinchcomb was that a number of cases had gone up to the Supreme Court of Canada trying to get an order directing the Crown to produce documentation in various types of proceedings. None of those had been successful, even under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms when it came in uh, after 1982. So our case came along, and as a matter of sort of legal brilliance, William Code, who I completely respect and owe all of my training to, made a decision early on that what we were going to do in the case of Mr. Stinchcomb's appeal to the Supreme Court was not attack all of the the problems that were associated with the underlying trial, and there were many, but to focus our appeal on one issue and one issue only, and that was basically the issue of Crown disclosure. What had happened in the case is there was a statement that had been taken by by the police of a former legal secretary to Mr. Stinchcomb, who had provided anecdotally that we understood through the the trial defense trial lawyer, 
information that would have been helpful to the defense of Mr. Stinchcomb and would have undermined the credibility of the complainant in the case against him. During the course of the trial, it became evident that that statement existed, but the Crown refused to produce the statement to the trial lawyer, as a result of which he was not in a position to call the witness without knowing what she had previously said to the Crown, because all you do, you can basically completely undermine your own case. So what we did, when I say we, the lead was Mr. Code. Mr. Code identified that we would put one issue only before the Supreme Court of Canada, and they had to make the decision. If they did not accept our leave to appeal, it would have effectively affirmed, without any ambiguity, that the Crown did not have an obligation even to provide an exonerating statement to the defendant. Or if they granted leave, they would have to make a decision clearly whether or not such statements or such information had to be disclosed or not. And the Supreme Court took it up and unanimously came back with a decision that rocked the entire criminal legal profession in 1991 and continues to do so because it finally declared that the information in the hands of the Crown prosecutor and the Crown were information and documentation that was in the interest of justice and not owned by the Crown. In other words, it was to be used and provided as required to see that justice was done in the case, both for the Crown and for the defense. And so it unequivocally required that documentation like the statement taken from Mr. Stinchcomb's legal secretary had to be disclosed. And this, I can't describe to you how earth-shaking this was when this came out. There was no intervention by other Crown attorney generals in Canada before the Supreme Court of Canada. It went up and the Supreme Court of Canada made that decision effectively, I think, looking at, at the legal culture and saying that this had to change and that the Crown and the police were not going to do so without clear direction from the Supreme Court. And that's what they did. Okay. And the, the one issue that was put before the Supreme Court of Canada, you mentioned that was Mr. Coates, I guess, discretion to do that. But why was that important for him to do it in that, that manner? Because you mentioned there were some, some other issues that were involved in the trial. Because what we had seen historically, we thought this was the best ground of appeal that we had. And we looked historically at the cases that had gone up to the Supreme Court and other courts of appeal before us. And they were always confused with, or at least intermingled with, other legal issues. And what would happen is the other legal issues would be addressed rather than focusing on a fundamental problem in criminal law which was the issue of, of the obligation of the Crown to make proper disclosure to the defense. And so Code, using his extensive history in, in litigation, decided that the way to get everyone's attention and to make sure that it was we focused on the issue that we thought we should win on was to have no other confusion or distraction other than the issue of Crown disclosure. And it basically put to a point the decision for the Supreme Court of Canada to either take the case, in which case, if they if they refused the case or took the case and dismissed it, dismissed it, it would have echoed throughout the system as being a matter of utter discretion to the Crown and the police as to what was disclosed. When they took it up and reversed the decision of the Alberta Court of Appeal, it sent the message that this university was something that was going to have to be fixed at a, at a cultural and fundamental level for criminal law, and that's exactly what it did. Right. And I just want to give listeners a, a bit of a an idea, you've already touched on it, but just to, the disclosure that was prior to Stinchcomb, as I understand it, it was very inconsistent and really varied from province to province. Is that accurate, John? That's absolutely accurate. And it varied from defense lawyer to defense lawyer and crown prosecutor to crown prosecutor or cop to cop. Because what was happening is if you had a good relationship with the police, if they considered you trustworthy, they would provide you more disclosure than if they didn't. And if they didn't like your client or were out to ensure a conviction, that had an impact on how much was disclosed as well. And so everything rested in the hands of, of discretion and, and subjective judgment. And that's what was creating problems. And it was all across the country. Right. And you mentioned Milligard, Morin, and, and the Marshall cases, and, and we won't get into the, the details of those, but essentially those were cases where it was ultimately determined that these men were wrongfully convicted and disclosure was an issue in those cases. How much of the adversarial process of our system, I guess, or my understanding is that trial by surprise, the adversarial nature of, of criminal law had been with the common law for, for hundreds of years, and that was kind of ingrained in the system. The trial by surprise, was that kind of the how disclosure was, was framed prior to Stinchcomb? More or less, it was, it was softening a bit 
by the time Stinchcomb came along, where at least there was some sensitivity that you had to provide at least some stuff to the defense to let them make full answer in defense. And what what was and when you if you go back and look historically at the criticism of what was happening with the system at that time pre Stinchcomb is the interests of justice were not being served at all by trial by surprise, nor by the fact that when you talk about trial by surprise, generally speaking, the crown had all the cards and all the resources. So the surprise was usually for the defense, not for the crown. And evening that playing field was an important part of, of criminal procedure as we move towards the decision in Stinchcomb. The extent to which you rely on subjective and discretionary choices moves you further and further away from both the obtaining justice in a case and ensuring that the defendant, if he loses or she loses, accepting the outcome as being fair. And so there was a real need to do something about the way things were proceeding. Trial by surprise, which originated with the original common or early common law, was something that we we struggled to get rid of both in civil and in criminal proceedings for centuries. <laughs> and so the Stinchcomb case represents a very major step forward in equalizing that. Right. And so the position of the parties, it seems so evident in retrospect because a Stinchcomb has been established for so long now in Canada, but it seems so straightforward to me that full disclosure is absolutely essential for a fair trial. But at the time, what was the Crown's argument to, to justify in the case of Mr. Stinchcomb not, not releasing this statement? Well, their justification was they weren't required to and, and that put the finest point of, of all on the decision that the Supreme Court made. So when you come in with an absolute view that you, you only have to produce things and in your discretion you think you should have to produce, the Supreme Court was, was put in a position of either having to, to accept that, in which case it would continue to be an issue of relying on subjectivity and discretion, or impose a rule. And unfortunately, the way the system had developed, and we can even see it now, if you rely on the police, if you rely on the Crown, without having a rule in place, quite often there'll be a, a problem. And the problem quite often is going to impact minority defendants uh, or marginalized defendants who don't have access to counsel that are known to the Crown or police, or who have just where there's an issue of prejudice or, or a desire just to obtain a conviction. And you can see that in all sorts of both civil and criminal cases in the US and in Canada, even now, where there's determinations being made that stuff that was important wasn't being disclosed to the defense where you know the concealment of, of information from body cams or statements that were taken by the police in, in in their notes immediately after the event contradicted by their own body cams or by uh, third-party videos so what the system needed and needs is more and more non-discretionary absolute rules about what needs to be disclosed and how a trial needs to progress so that it is fair to the defendant. Okay, and we'll touch on on how you view the disclosure laws in, in Canada today here later on, but just I want to go back to Stinchcomb and just work our way through that. So the, the statement that really was at issue in the case was one made by Mr. Stinchcomb's secretary. And as I understand it, it was a favorable statement and Crown decided that they weren't going to release it because, quote, she was non-credible. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. And at trial, Mr. Stinchcomb was convicted, as you've already indicated. Were you involved in the Court of Appeal decision or just the Supreme Court of Canada? Yep. Both, of, both oh. Court of Appeal. And okay. Court. And Court of Appeal just dismissed it and didn't provide right. reasons, right? Yeah. Welcome to Alberta. Yes. Dismissed, as I recall, without reasons. Right. And when it went to the Supreme Court of Canada, what ultimately you've already indicated, this case changed the landscape, it shook the disclosure laws in Canada. But how did the Supreme Court couch this fundamental right? Where, how did they, they arrive at the conclusion that full disclosure should be a constitutional obligation? Well, interestingly, because because these a similar applications or appeals had been considered under the Charter directly, what we did is characterize not just under the charter, but focused heavily on the criminal code, which requires and, and sets out a right for the defense to make full answer defense, to be given the opportunity to make full answer defense. So we actually couched it not just under the charter, but tied it heavily into the criminal code provisions, uh, which were statutory and non-constitutional. And the court picked up on both the statutory provisions of the criminal code as well as the charter. And as it as the case was subsequently considered by other by other courts, the charter rights became even more paramount than the statutory criminal code rights. 
Okay. And it, I guess subsequent treatment of it is primarily focuses on section seven of the charter, which states that everyone has the right to life, liberty, security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And I guess it's the principles of fundamental justice where a lot of courts have focused on the need for disclosure. That's correct. And if I can just add one one piece historically as to what happened with Stinchcombe after the Supreme Court of Canada decision, and a lot of people don't know where it went, but it went back for uh, two retrials. And it, in both of the retrials, what was, what happened was it turns out that the Crown and the police didn't just sit on the statement made by Mr. Stinchcombe's secretary, but also sat on information uh, and documents created by the complainant who had alleged he had property interests in certain items and in his own bankruptcy filings, which were in the possession of the Crown, said okay. that he no longer had those in his possession or power. In other words, he had no property interest in what he was alleging he owned. And the Crown sat on that same information. And on the second retrial, it went back and the Crown confessed that that had happened and walked away from the prosecution so that Mr. Stinchcombe was not convicted of anything. Right. And John, keep going back to this, but dis- disclosure prior to Stinchcombe. So in a case like this, a Crown would just submit, send over a package and that would be it. They, they would have total discretion. Like how would defense discover that Crown might be in possession of other information? So there was a whole bunch of stuff happening across the system. In some cases, they would provide you a Crown disclosure package that would be whatever they thought you might need in their discretion and based on their view. Uh, in other systems, you would actually have to attend before a staff sergeant who was in charge of disclosure. They would read to you the particulars of the offense and sometimes provide you or show you documents that they intended to rely upon. Back in those days, quite often you wouldn't even get the police officer's notes. You'd only see those live in trial. So the whole thing was was set up, unless you were a defendant who had substantial resources and a very good relationship with the Crown and the police, you were in deep trouble in terms of how much information you would have. And you could basically count on your trial being won by surprise. And this affected particularly people who were, were being defended by legal aid or who were impecunious and having to hire their own private counsel. If you're under-resourced, you couldn't fight fairly. If you were over-resourced, you might have a chance. So ultimately, like like we talked about, it really came back to relationships you had with maybe the police and, and Crown, but also uh, how sophisticated and knowledgeable you were of, of the system as it as it was then. That's correct. So this is another kind of evident question, John, but why is disclosure, complete disclosure of relevant information so important to ensure that an accused receives a fair trial? The Crown, and again, pre-Stinchcombe, the Crown's view was they needed to show you what they were going to use to prove your prove their case. And so they would show you all the stuff that identified why your client might be guilty, the statements taken, the, the pictures taken, whatever investigative product they received. What was almost always missing was the information that was exonerating for the accused. And you can see the best examples of that in the three M's, Milgard, Moran, and Marshall, where they did not receive, they received plenty of disclosure about why their clients might be guilty, but almost no disclosure about uh, potential alibis or other alternative defendants or accused who might be involved. Marshall's probably the best exam, example of the character named Ebsery, who they had interviewed and thought was a suspect, none of which was ever disclosed to Marshall. And so that's that's the culture that you would have. You'd walk in thinking your client, basically all this information was piled up against your client, but you'd have no clue if the resourced crown had actually gone out and found exonerating evidence that they weren't producing to you. And so again, put yourself in the shoes of an under-resourced or, or poor defendant You've got no way of fighting back. You can't hire your own private investigator. You can only guess who might be interviewing you. You don't have the power of the police to go and compel someone or at least encourage someone to give you an interview to tell you all the exonerating information that might be out there. And it led to all sorts of, in my view, wrongful guilty pleas on the part of especially the poor who couldn't fight back and who all their defense lawyer would see is all the reasons why their client was guilty. And what our system needed was justice and justice only comes when both parties are fully informed of the case that they have to meet and can walk into a courtroom effectively on an equal footing have their case adjudicated by an independent independent adjudicator or judge and then the result looks and feels fair and it's fair both in terms of how the public perceives it but most importantly and i have this from an 
senior lawyer who I truly respect, Chris Pellier in Toronto, who said the most important person in the courtroom is the defendant. It's the guy who loses if he loses. He needs to be able to, or she needs to be able to walk out of that courtroom feeling, okay, I was found guilty or found liable, but the process was fair and I had an opportunity to be heard. If we don't have that, the system is a fail to the people who, who walk out of the system feeling as if the process was unfair. And that Stinchcomb moves a long way down the road to try to ensure that fairness and that perception happens for the loser in the courtroom. Right. And and Stinchcomb talked a lot about the fruits of the investigation and Crown Counsel's role in criminal proceedings is is to quote a minister of justice and to present the evidence and lay it on the on the table and let hopefully allow the judge or trier of fact to get to the the truth of what happened. Right. And it's a bit idealistic, but the the anticipation is that the Crown will be stoic and indifferent as to whether there is a conviction or an acquittal, providing their evidence is adduced before the court, properly challenged and heard. Right. So for Stinchcomb, the Supreme Court of Canada made the decision that all relevant evidence and material should be disclosed, whether it was inculpatory or exculpatory. It didn't matter if they were going to use it at trial or not. Can you take us through how they defined relevance? And that, that Trevor, is the real issue that has plagued the Stinchcomb decision and its impact, whether it's in criminal or civil or administrative law as we move forward. So the decision in Stinchcomb was all relevant material where the, the Crown was called upon not to make decisions about whether, as they did in that case, the witness may or may not in their view be credible or whether the evidence was, was exonerating or inculpatory. They had to produce information that bore on any issue in the proceeding that would allow the case either to be made or to be defeated. What's happened since is two things. There were two tensions that resulted. One is you're relying a lot on on people exercising some measure of judgment. And, and Stinchcomb was an attempt to try to constrain that, dis- that judgment so that there was less discretion and less subjectivity in what was considered relevant. In other words, define relevance broadly. No one liked that because two things would happen. One is you would have an overproduction if the Crown was acting in bad faith. So you would receive, and we, I had this happen in a case in, in Edmonton, where you had overproduction in a disorganized fashion of every document that the Crown could come up with. And you wind up being effectively inundated with too much information to be able to properly analyze it. So suddenly too much disclosure became effectively no disclosure or inadequate disclosure because it wasn't organized or consumable by, again, an under-resourced defendant. And the second tension was it created pressures on on the Crown where if they had not investigated areas, whether they were obligated to do that at the request of the defense. And thirdly, if I can add another aspect of it, the, the disclosure also led to issues about how much information concerning the complainant might be relevant to the proceeding. And this became especially important in sexual assault cases where the demands for disclosure would would intrude deeply upon the psychological framework of the complainant, their attempts to obtain therapy, uh, and that sort of thing, all of which might be used to undermine unfairly the complainant in the process. So you had those three tensions of overproduction, the desire to ensure that you had a good, you understood the case that you had to meet, as well as whether the police had to investigate areas that they hadn't, and the degree to which it might intrude upon the rights of a complainant or others in their personal lives for only marginally relevant issues. Okay. And so there's still quite a bit of, uh, I guess, discretion on the part of Crown Counsel in terms of what they need to disclose, though, correct? Yeah. And the, the, the cases that followed Stinchcomb and interpreted it largely focused on the issue of where the Crown had exercised its discretion not to produce some document and that document was subsequently discovered and then in, dealt with or areas where production of documents had not been explored by the the police or the crown and the defense sought production of things that may or may not be in the possession of the crown as part of the investigation so it really unpacked over time what had to be produced how it had to be produced and the, the scope of the production in terms of how far it might dig into the the rights of the non-parties that is a complaint or other witnesses Okay. And the, the Supreme Court in Stinchcomb, how did they envision resolving disputes around disclosure? 
Well, effectively, they, they put the risk on the crown. And so they basically said, you produce as much as, as is necessary to ensure a fair trial, including exculpatory information and evidence. Or if there is a review and it is established that there's been an unfair process where you have failed to disclose relevant information, the risk is you lose, you, you have a stay of proceedings or an acquittal that winds up being entered. So it effectively said to the crown, you run the risk if you don't produce. And rather than the old system, which was basically to the accused, if you can't figure it out, you may be convicted. Okay. And now I think it's a good time to discuss this, where the courts have really couched this full answer in defense and to complete disclosure in Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Have the courts, in your opinion, John, created an independent right where the Crown fails to disclose information that is automatically a constitutional violation, or is it something that needs to be interpreted more broadly in terms of prejudice to the accused? Well, it's both. I think it winds up, there's two aspects of that. One is, has there been a constitutional violation? And the second, what is the remedy for that? And so I think any non-disclosure of relevant information to the Crown, whether advertent or inadvertent, is a breach of the constitutional rights of the accused. The question is, what comes from that? And if it is a piece of material evidence that goes to the, the clearly goes to the issue of the charge. The Crown runs the risk that there will be a stay of proceedings or an acquittal that winds up being entered or other evidence refused for admission because of the non-production. Uh, in other cases, the and you see this quite a bit, where there's been non-disclosure and it's been identified and it was a close judgment call, there's a constitutional violation, but the remedy winds up being a an adjournment with an order for production. I went through a case again, one in Edmonton, where we went through two years of disclosure motions, where there was determinations that were missing documentation and charter violations, but multiple adjournments. And just to tell you how it all ended in that case, it turned out after about the fifth round of adjournment motions, the Crown confessed that it actually had documents in its possession. I think it was the lead investigator had an entire stacks box of documents in its possession, which were wow. relevant. They had been in his office and he hadn't disclosed them for two years. And I think the Crown was embarrassed enough that they effectively asked for a stay of proceedings on their own motion. So this can, it, it, like disclosure can take years before the trial may even begin. On complex cases, absolutely. So practically, John, now that, you know, with Stinchcomb and the subsequent cases that came after, how does disclosure look now between Crown and Defense? Do they still send over a package and a list of documents? Or can you describe that a bit for us? I think the police have learned and the Crown has learned substantially that Full disclosure is really important, and they, they then turn over everything they have. I, I think the worry is a little bit that if they think there might be an exculpatory witness, they may not carry out a full interview, in which case you don't, you don't see it because they don't have it. And in other cases, the problem can be the fact that if you generate, especially on a larger case, huge amounts of documentation and wind up handing that over to a defendant who's, who's under-resourced, their ability to analyze that information becomes problematic. On the other hand, I think where we are now, at least culturally, with exceptions for there's, there's always bad apples, in the, whether in the Crown or the police, culturally, I think there's a sense that full disclosure has to be made, and they're making it. And I, I would add, if I can just touch on some aspects of this that, that come, out, come out, what's happening now, I think, across the system is there's a recognition that, that the production documentation can take a long time and burn a lot of resources. And I think both in civil law, administrative law, and criminal law, there's a bit of a retrenchment now to trying to have some subjective judgment about what's really important and what may not be really important. And I think that change in, and you see it in, in developments in the rules of civil procedure in, in Alberta, as an example, is putting more and more weight back on the subjective and discretionary view of the producing party, whether it's the Crown or in the civil case, the producing civil litigant. And the, the degree to which you do that, you then hope or pray that your defense is somehow understood and known by the opponent. And as they make productions, they're, they're honestly assessing what your defense is so that they're producing documents that are relevant to that. The danger is you have someone who decides that I only see this case as going one way and I think you only have this one defense and I produce my documents accordingly. That may not be complete for you when you're looking at it as the defendant saying, I have other theories of my non-culpability. So that's that's creating issues as we, we get a retrenchment in terms of back to subjective, subjective and discretionary production, trying to limit the amount of documents and resources that are used to, to permit disclosure. But I would say 
fundamentally, I think there has been an acceptance within the legal community and the, the sorry, the Crown prosecutors and the police investigative community that disclosure is fundamental as a right and that they're doing their best to do that. What I would like to see is far more constraints on the, the subjective and discretionary aspects of it that are starting to crop back up as we deal with the tension of overproduction and the use of resources. Okay. So overproduction, John, is that kind of death by paper cut to use that <laughs> that, that yeah. phrase where they just unload documents and hope that you can't get through all of them? Yeah. And again, it, it hangs on resources. If you're a well-resourced hedge fund litigant in a criminal case, you may have the resources to pour into private investigators and legal teams to sort through it all. But if you're poor uh, or under-resourced and you wind up with a, a truckload of documents that are poorly organized, these days getting into electronic document management is, is important, but the that resource is not available to everyone. And even with that resource being available to everyone, people need to be able to know how to use it and have the resources to do the inputs and the data, data entry. So it could be a real problem. So does the manner of disclosure then, does the court have much to say about that? So for instance, in a case where there's you know 50,000 documents or whatever, if they just send over a truck, does the court expect there to be organization or, okay, we need you to put it on disks or is there any type of obligation like that? It Some part hangs on what the Crown or the, and this, this is equally applicable in civil cases, it's what resources they've committed to organizing the documents. So if they have that and they use a particular program, they may send you the documents with that program, which show you a bunch of images and dates, but otherwise don't organize the documents in any way. That's easier than pulling out a train car load of documents manually, but it doesn't take you very far down the road of actually trying to get through those documents in a meaningful way to compare the defense of your client. We've just run into this in the federal court of trying to get an order where the Department of Justice had in its possession a database that was organized and had been categorized and with a huge amount of data that had been input in terms of translating or at least transliterating the handwriting into searchable text. And we tried to get production of that. It had been created by the Department of Justice. This is in a civil case. But the court refused to order the production of those documents in that form, in a usable form, to us to allow us to, to work our case and move forward. So we're sitting on a pile, in this case, as millions of records of documents that we now have to try to go through manually. And it creates a real burden when you have the Department of Justice, on the other hand, having that stuff with the resources available to them organized and managed and searchable. So it varies case to case. It varies judge to judge as to what they expect or intend to impose. And it depends on how, in a large measure, what the Crown has actually created and what is in their possession of power as a document for the investigation or as their work product as they prepare for trial. And so my understanding is when Crown does claim privilege over a document or material, and there's in in the criminal world anyway, that privilege usually is confined to confidential informer. There's there's obviously other ones, but that's kind of a, a regular one when that is claimed, although I understand it to be rare. And then they can also not produce because they believe it to be completely irrelevant. So when they when they they don't disclose that information on either irrelevance or privilege. Do they have to present a list to you and, and show you, okay, give you a general idea of the document or material and, and give you the reason why they're not disclosing it? No, but if you figure out that it's there, that's what you push to get the, them to declare to the court. There is other areas of privilege that get that get brought into play, some of which is, is involved with giving legal advice to the police independent of the Crown process and evaluating the prosecution. And they quite often will bury stuff in there. So yeah, you have to discover that it's there and then the challenge is to go into court, push to get a document you've never seen before and have it reviewed. But other than in, in limited categories, they don't tell you in advance of what documents they have not produced. So it, again, it comes down to resources for defense because if it's a certain type of trial, are you using just your experience and, and knowledge to say, okay, a document should exist, so let's ask for it and see what they say? That's exactly right. And part of part of what you need to do creatively, whether again, criminal administrative or, or civil, is to think of the documents that may be out there and put them as clearly as possible to your the crown or to your opponent, so that if they deny the existence of the documents, it's something you wind up being in, in, in existence. 
that can create a bad faith that would motivate a stay in or an acquittal in a way that might not if it was only discovered mid-trial. So the key is to do questioning up front on the documents that you think might be missing. Demand clear answers as to whether or not they're there. If they're there to then challenge their non-production by an application to court. So that's that's the sort of what counsel now have to do, but it's a lot of creativity that goes into figuring out what may or may not be there when you're dealing with a void. So I want to talk now about just the, the timing of disclosure we just we just mentioned. It's usually before the trial begins. What did Stinchcomb have to say about when disclosure should be made and why is it important to have it made when it when they felt it should be? Well, it, this is one of the one of the aspects of Stinchcomb that was never followed except in sort of lip service. The decision in Stinchcomb said that in most cases, full disclosure should be made before you call upon the accused to enter their plea. And I can tell you in practice that never happens or almost never happens. It's one of the things they've completely gotten away from just for practicality purposes. And, and I can sort of, I think the Supreme Court might have been a bit pie in the sky and thinking that that could be achieved in that kind of a time frame. But the problem is now, is the degree to which the courts, and again, this goes varies from court to court, is the late disclosure of documents. So you'll go through a process where the bulk of your production is, is made and the Crown remains under the obligation to produce documents going forward as they become relevant, as they become come into their possession of power. And the question is, if they hold back, whether deliberately or inadvertently, documents that are not relevant and produce them only on the eve of trial, that can often result in an adjournment. Less often, those adjournments result in an order for costs. And what that means is you have a defense counsel and a defendant who have poured resources into preparing for trial wind up getting an adjournment and have to just bear those costs pending the outcome. And so I think there needs to be far more pressure and because it, this is not something that's been completely made absolute. There needs to be a lot more pressure that documents have to be produced in full by, such, by a given date or a given point in the proceedings, failing which there will be orders against the Crown, whether by way of acquittal or otherwise, depending on the nature of the non-produced documents. But it creates a lot of uncertainty when the court system isn't absolute in terms of what it does with late production. And junk disclosure seems to be an ongoing responsibility on, on Crown or an obligation of Crown. Does disclosure happen even at trial? Yes. And it is less problematic. So as an example, you have a trial, a defense witness says, a defense witness says something or a Crown witness says something no one anticipated, mentions a person. The police then go out mid-trial and do an interview of that person. The obligation under Stinchcomb or disclosure law is you only have to provide what you have in your possession or power. So if they do that interview mid-trial, their obligation is not to sit on it for weeks, but to produce it immediately upon obtaining it to the defendant, regardless of what the outcome is. The defense can ask for an adjournment, but not because there's been any non-compliance with disclosure obligations but simply as a matter of trial fairness to give them an opportunity to respond. And the Crown's not criticized because if they only just did the investigative step mid-trial and only generate the document for production, then that's when it has to be produced. What becomes problematic is when they sat on documentation that's relevant and only produce it at trial. And that is the very thing that winds up like Stinchcomb ending up in, in stays of proceedings or acquittals or refusal to admit other relevant evidence. Okay. And in Stinchcomb, they did put primary obligation on Crown Council to disclose all relevant information and material, but they did talk about Defence Council's role in the disclosure process. Can you just walk us through that? Yeah, so that's that's evolving even as we speak. The issue of when just competing interests between the right of the, the accused not to be involved in his own conviction for self-crimination in other words, can I compel you to tell me if you have an alibi? And part of the answer is to say, well, under the charter, I have a right against self, self-incrimination, so I have no obligation to tell you. On the other hand, we want to avoid trial by surprise and ensure that justice is done. So the question, for example, of whether an alibi evidence has to be adduced in advance of trial to give the Crown fair, fair warning becomes an important right. And I think evolutionarily we're, we're realizing that it's more important now to start to create some level of obligations without requiring an accused to incriminate himself to at least identify aspects of their case which are exonerating so that the prosecution has an opportunity to investigate that and fairly try it at trial 
again, what it does or tries to avoid is a situation where an alibi witness comes up mid-trial, the Crown asks for an adjournment because of surprise. Uh, if not granted, it looks unfair. If granted, it, it creates delays in the system. So I think the tendency now is to start slowly, slowly, slowly against the right against self-crimination to, to push for some measure of disclosure of at least exonerating information from the accused. But that's not anything that's being made absolute like in Stinchcomb. Okay, so that's that's an area of the law that might be developing as we move ahead here. In terms of what defense counsel has to do to ensure their client is receiving full disclosure, what, what obligations do they have? They need to they need to fully evaluate whatever documentation they do receive. They need then to make sure that the crown is aware of the defenses that they may advance, not specific issues or specific evidence necessarily, but areas of defense to test that the crown has produced all documents that are relevant to the full defense as understood. In other words, don't let the crown make a decision about what they think is relevant. Tell them what's relevant so the production is made. And then what, what counsel really need to do is to sit back and think, if I were a prosecutor or a police investigator on this, what should I be doing? What should I have done if I was even handed about or stoic about whether there was a conviction or an acquittal that was to be entered? Who would I interview that might be exculpatory? Who would I interview that might be inculpatory? What documents or searches would I conduct in the public record or, or through banks or whatever? to determine both exculpatory and inculpatory information. And then what you do is you, you start writing letters to the Crown and making demands for production of documents or confirmation either that that investigation has not been done or if done, the documents and, and information is being produced. But it really, it, it demands a lot of creativity on the part of the Defence Council and a lot of very clear communication to the Crown to ensure that, that you get a proper denial or a positive response saying, here's the documentation. And defense counsel can't sit back, like if they discover that, okay, Crown has this, they can't strategically or tactically say, let's sit back on it and then argue that the, the trial was unfair. They have that obligation to be proactive. Well, if they have the document in their possession or power already, the issue of disclosure becomes a bit moot. Um, and so you may point out the impropriety of the Crown not having not produced it. But if the question is, in your establishing that, you demonstrate that you've had it in your possession all along, that could be a problem. Similarly, if you knew a document was there or knew an, an area of the investigation had been conducted but wasn't, wasn't in your disclosure package, if you don't raise that, but it was evident, the problem at trial is going to wind up being that you knew you should have asked and it winds up being an adjournment rather than the acquittal of your or a stay of proceedings in favor of your client. So you, you run that risk. So the, the best thing defense counsel can do in my view is, is get that in the, in the, get that in the crown's head immediately, put them on notice, demand full production and ensure that you neither have a delay nor an unclear response as to what's there or isn't there. And John, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the role that police play in ensuring proper disclosure. We've touched on it briefly a little bit, but Stinchcomb established and, and subsequent cases to establish that although the police are separate and distinct from Crown, they are considered to have the same first party obligations as Crown. How does Crown satisfy themselves that the police have handed over all their records, all the relevant information? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, what I've seen recently or more recently is the crown pushing with correspondence to get make sure that there's full production in almost doing what the defense counsel's done in terms of did you guys investigate in this or that area if so produce the results the interesting development has been the use by the police of of, of their own lawyers so wind up obtaining legal advice about what they may or may not be required to produce independent of what the crown's doing the crown prosecutor's doing my view is that that's completely inappropriate, but that's what's happening. So you wind up with this review being conducted that is subject to a solicitor and client privilege by the police's own lawyers. And if they decide something isn't producible as confidential or privileged, that doesn't wind up moving up the system. And I think you'd alluded to this before. I, at some point, we may need a rule that says that any of that kind of information actually has to be identified as being privileged so that it's at least known to the defense counsel that it's there, but a claim of privilege is being made in relation to it. We have that, that process in, civil, in our civil courts where you have to, in your production of documents, identify documents that you have in your possession or power, but you aren't going to produce because you're saying that they're privileged in one way or the other. So we're telling our opponents that in civil law, we should have a similar obligation probably in the criminal law 
to the extent police rely on, on their own counsel. So I guess Crown Counsel would still have to rely and trust that, that the police force or the investigating officers are just presenting everything relevant. Like Crown Counsel may not actually see every investigative record or document. They're just given what the police force believes to be relevant to the investigation. That's correct. Unless you have an embedded prosecutor in a unit, that's they have to rely on the good faith of the of the police force. You know, the issue is that at a fundamental level, whether it's the police or the crown prosecutor, that system has checks and balances so that, if, for example, if you have a police force that's known for non-production or gets caught out several times, there's an ability to discipline that force either through the, the provincial attorney general or through the federal attorney general to correct whatever's going on and demand modifications to that police unit to ensure some level of compliance. So the Crown has the ability to correct itself if it starts to see systemic failings like that. But otherwise, it's it's a reliance on the good faith on the officers who are involved in the prosecution. And, you know, the, and we've got plenty of evidence where, where the police officers involved in a prosecution have been less than honest in the information that they've provided as part of the investigation, whether by way of their own notes, that they wind up being contradicted by video evidence, either you know, body cams or third-party video, which makes you wonder about the good faith of, of at least some of the police that are involved in this. And you hope, you know, there's always bad apples out there, but you hope that the majority of, of police officers and police forces are taking their obligation seriously and producing all the relevant information. Yes, and, and I've got to tell you, I've, I've acted for hundreds of, of RCMP and, and provincial police officers, and for the most part, they understand the obligation. They hate it, but they do it. I can't tell you the amount of times when I've acted for a client and I've advised them that I did the Stinchcomb case. I, I get a long lecture about how awful <laughs> it is. But the ones that lecture me the most, I think, are the ones that are the most the most honest about what they produce. So, John, I am mindful of your time now. And just in closing, you've kind of suggested and made some comments already. But where would you like to see changes in disclosure laws in Canada? Or what do you think needs to happen to maybe make disclosure a better process in Canada? So I would go against the trend, whether in criminal, civil, or administrative law, and I think we need to reduce substantially the amount to which we rely on the subjective or discretionary judgment of the party that's required to produce documents. In other words, have more absolute rules about how we meet, how we define relevance and materiality for a given case. Um, and some part of that, I think, can be or should be mandating that there be an identification of what areas of the case are relevant both for defense and for prosecution purposes so there's no question about what the crown is required to produce and so they can't say well we didn't realize you were going to bring that defense or this defense so we didn't produce that i think that needs to be a a process that needs to be interjected again in civil criminal or administrative law to reduce the reliance on subjective or discretionary judgment Okay. And maybe as we talked about having a list defining what's material, but having an idea of what they're actually holding back or not disclosing as well. That's yes. Yeah, sorry. That's correct. To have that list. Yeah. Okay, John. Well, it's, it's been great to have you on the, on the podcast. And, and again, we really appreciate your time, your insights, and obviously firsthand knowledge of, of Stinchcomb was, was really great to hear. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Trevor. It's been a pleasure.